Hey folks, and welcome to Let's Talk. This is my show where I sit down with subject matter experts and or people well-versed in a certain topic in tabletop and we editorialize, give our opinions, and generally discuss the comings, goings, and current hot news. Now this isn't necessarily as G-rated as the rest of GMG, so uh, viewer and listener discretion is advised. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Let's Talk. Uh, this is my show where we sit down, pick a tabletop sort of topic, and then discuss it with people who know a lot more about it than I do. So today I have a Mike Wolf on the channel. Um, Mike has been coming to GMG for, geez, what, like three years now? Four years sure, almost? Sure, Three years, Probably, I think, maybe, I don't know. I think no. the first time we did a bunch of Frostgrave. We did um, a bunch of Frostgrave. Then we did Ghost time. Archipelago for the second one. Uh, that might have been the third one, actually. Was it the third one? Because we, did, we, we hammered either. that out. We did a bunch, oh no, it was AOS was the second one. Yeah. Um, and then the third one, I think, was the ghost because you did all that great boat stuff. Yeah, yeah I did all the boat stuff. Yeah, that was three D printed. Yeah, and that was three D printed. Um, and Mike is one of the most prolific three D printers as a hobbyist, not as like a business person that I know. Um, and Caveat, you know, like I am not an expert. Well, you're, you're not. I an know expert. some stuff, but well, I am not an expert. So, so here's the thing: is you know more than the average hobbyist does. Maybe. And you also work in technology, so you have a much firmer grasp on the technology of this. Loose on the technology, sure. Yeah. <laughs> than I do. Sure. <laughs> at yeah. least. Uh, um, and you've been printing stuff in the hobby, so like. Yes. Is, those are the three big key things for, me, for choosing someone to come on here, because Mike does a lot of printing too, but he's been talking about other things recently. I want to have somebody else come on and talk about this technology in general and also its applications and and really get your opinion on some of the major sort of like i think conceptions of what 3d printing is on the internet sure um and i've got three i want to talk about and the yeah. first one is do you think that 3d printing is eventually going to kill miniature wargaming companies no because that's a really big no idea in the end so why? i mean it could potentially when the 3D printers get to the point where they're idiot proof, like 100% idiot proof, right. what you may see is a shift in the market, not just in tabletop, but like the whole marketplace will shift where you can actually just buy the digital copy of the product and print something at home. Because that's kind of Steam right now, isn't it, for video games? Yeah, it's your, yeah sure, sure. You know I mean, I mean it's like, like that. It, I mean, obviously, this is it's a little bit more technical in this one. You know, the machines. I'm talking about like you're, gonna buy, you're not going to go to Walmart to buy your spoons. True. Is that what I mean? Because when I see 3D printing breaking into that level of technology. Right it's replacing buying small objects like everywhere. Exactly, and right? I think that's what you're gonna find is you're gonna find like, you're gonna find that if it's easy enough for me just to print it overnight, right, or something like right. that, and I don't have to do anything other than click something on the website like Amazon or whatever, buy it, and then I wake up the next morning and my stuff is actually in my printer already like done and clean and everything, Right. which is, it's entirely possible that that will actually happen um, within the, probably the next 10 years uh, to some degree. Like you may see a shift moving away where like a GW or a Reaper or something like that, they just sell you the digital content and you right. can print it at home. But I mean, they're already there. Tech like they could do that now. They totally could do yeah. that now. Because most of what they're doing is, th is 3D design. It's all ZBrushed anyway. Sure, right? sure, sure. But the issue you run into is like the quality of prints that you can get at home. Right. Um, unless you do something like a resin SLA or something like that, you're not going to get, you know, injected molded quality. So, t so tell me then. So when we're talking about quality of printers, so like I got some stuff in front of me here, right? Yeah. Um, and this is the stuff you guys have all seen on camera. Uh, and for you listening to these guys as a podcast, I'm just going to describe it all. So I've got some of the great um, uh, uh, printed uh, terrain, um, which my buddy Mark Chabot made for his little SDL company. Uh, I've got some of the Immortal Kings um, resin printed robots for, that I'm using for Gamma Wolves that were uh, printed by Immortal Kings. And I've got some arms that Mike printed for me actually in resin for one of my Warlord Titans from back before there was actually like Mike from Epic Mike, Mike, Mike yeah. from Epic sorry, not Mike Wolf. As I have like a posse of mics. Yeah. <laughs> Army of I'm mics. With. Um, and I actually have some here in a bag too. They're all printed. So these are two different types of, of printing. And for like the layman listening, what are the differences here technology wise? Like sure. this one's all filament. So this whole set of building kits here. Yeah. Uh, they're huge. Like these are big kits. are all done yep. in filament. These are done in resin. Yep. What Technologically speaking and price speaking, like what? why is this not something that's just taking over Wargaming and... Well, FDM is picking up probably more and more now because the machines are getting really cheap. Uh, you can get a really good printer for like 199 bucks that can print really high quality stuff. Like, but could I do it? Yes, you could. So you I, could. So not knowing anything about 3D printing, could yes. I buy that thing? You could it? buy the Creality and going through a forum, you could probably figure out how to do it without too much of an effort. You're going to have some failures. You might get frustrated kind of deal, but you can generally work your way through it. The, the FDM printers have come a long, long way. And they're not just like the kits of old. You can buy most of them now almost pre-assembled to where it maybe takes you an hour to get them up and running yep. and maybe an hour to dial them in. Um, and in most cases, you can actually download the profiles for like anything that you want to print. Like I have this type of 
um, PLA or I have this type of ABS and this is the type of printer I'm running and you can load those profiles right into your favorite slicer and the printer will be pretty good. It's like um, it'll just take the object and cut it for you. And yeah, 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 exactly. Well, that's what the slicer does, right? right. So like a Cura or like a Prusa slicer or um, a 3D print simple, I can't remember what that one's called. You know, those are the slicers. So basically what they do is they take the STLs or the OBJs and that's the file that you get from the creator, right? right. You're and it, yeah, it takes them and puts it in what's called G code, right? The G code is actually telling the machine like where I'm going, how much I'm extruding versus how much I'm not extruding, how cool am I gonna pull, cool the part down as I'm going around or how much am I not gonna cool the part down, you know, right. all that fun stuff like that. And that's all in the G code, right? So the slicer produces the G code, the G code is what you're actually printing out. And that's what's printing out. And so so then this object here, for instance, it was in two pieces. Yeah, for sure. Um, and for you guys who can't see it, it's about 10 by 10, probably the size of the, the print bed for this. And how long would you say it would take to print something that big? That looks like it's probably at a high resolution draft print. So just the one piece, given the height and the amount of time in the base, that could easily be 25, 20, 26 hours. And how much like bucks in like material? <sighs> Honestly, maybe 350. Three dollars fifty cents. Yeah, that's, maybe. So that, I mean, there, there's a, there's obviously a cost savings. Like yeah. my, once you have the printer, that's like a legitimate. It's cost all in what type in of this... filament you buy, though, right? Because right. that's the thing. There's tons of grades of filament out there, so you can buy like an Amazon Basic filament if you get it on sale for like twelve ninety nine, right. which is nothing, right? That's two kilograms of filament. You can print a lot of stuff with two gram two kilograms of filament, right? And these are hollow too. That's yeah. an important to remember. So if you look on the base of this, it looks like it's solid, but inside of this, there's actually a honeycomb pattern. So yeah. and the honeycomb pattern exists to give it stability and rigidity, and also like so that you can actually inside. print like flat surfaces, right? Because the one thing that FBN, FDM is not great at is bridging. So that's when you're going from like one part to another part. And what happens is, is because you're heating plastic, gravity takes hold and will cause like drooping, and drooping right? And yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah, so bri that's what called bridging. Um, so that's why you build the honeycomb up in there. So you don't have to worry about the top of your model getting all gross. Um, so why isn't, so I mean, obviously for, for scenery, especially I'd say, I have seen like an uptick in the last couple of years mm -hmm. in in the popularity of buying STLs and printing scenery. Yeah, for sure. Like I went to Adepticon last year and there was tons of people playing on 3D printed scenery. They had 3D printed accessories. Well, the Frostbite table last the year. The Frostbite table like last year, that. Yep. And that's because I think that's where FDM, which is what this type of printing is, it excels at, right? So how many years has it taken for that to like get to the market? Super, super fast, actually. Yeah. I'd say in the last two to three years, it's become to the point, again, like the Creality Ender, which is that 199 one? I'm sure, like the people that are going to comment on this one, they're going to talk about that one and right. how quality and how like you can actually print some really good stuff with that. Um, like it's just gotten to the point where it sort of kind of just does most of the stuff by itself. Right. Um, again, it you know they can catastrophic failure. You can run into that kind of stuff. Like, something can always um, go wrong. It you can uh, you can yeah. miss like get a bad G code or whatever and come back and have this big octopus spaghetti mess or <laughs> um, or like gum up the stuff. It's still not something that someone like. Like you wouldn't give it to your kids right. kind of deal. You'd want a supervisor or whatever. But I mean, again, if you, if you, if you half pay attention to it, you can actually get some pretty decent results out of it. So what about the convenience factor though? Because there is like, there is something to be said for being able just to buy something ready to go. See, so that's where I actually hit the wall, right? right. So as you know, I, I work a ton, right? Yeah. Um, and that sort of kind of imposes on both my hobby time for actually like the tabletop stuff and then on the 3D printing stuff, right? right. So the 3D printing stuff you tend to, it can actually tend to be work. Um, because you've got to slice your files, you got to figure out, you know, how you're going to get it all to fit on your bed, depending on what it is that you're trying to print. Are you trying to do multiple prints in one go? You know, trying to maximize that print time as much as you possibly can. So you just turn the damn thing on and you leave and then come back and hope everything turned out okay. Yeah. Um, versus like the other part of the hobby, which is actually playing the games. And I'd rather play the games. Right. You'd rather get to so, the end result. So it's yeah. like, it is, it is still, there's still a lot of work involved in getting sure, sure. the end result. So, cause, cause from, from my point of view, the argument I always sort of had in my head as to why the the popularity of this stuff isn't it while it may while the, the technology clearly is exploding like sure, just for sure. like just looking at these mortal kings measures i wouldn't well, that's know that we haven't even gotten into and it we'll, and we'll yeah. get to that but i'm saying is the technology has moved to a place now where sure. where most miniatures you even buy in metal are 3D prints originally. They're coming yep. from ZBrush sculpts. They're being the masters are being 3D printed, and then they're being cast. Well, in the metal. resin even can look better than a metal than cast a metal sculpt. Exactly. Yeah. So, so uh, the level of detail is is impeccable. But at the same time, there's always that problem of convenience, right? Like people people don't want to wait. They still want to just rip something open and go. Yeah. And if it's going to take you like, because you always say, like, oh, I could print that dreadnought for 
60 cents or whatever but if it's going to take you it's it's yeah, getting it of time, cutting and then how many failures yeah. did you have to get it to go and you know you're gonna have some anomalies like even these right and they're printed pretty well for tabletop they're absolutely yeah. perfect and for right? the size of them yeah like, and for yeah. the size of them but if you look at them you can see skipped layers you can see z shift in there i mean they're not perfect right and when you say dreadnought right when you print that dreadnought you want them to look pretty epic right yeah. you want them to look good you want them to match all your other gw stuff right fdm printer is never going to get you there it's right. never going to be able to print seamlessly like, if you put next to a gw miniature it's yeah not and the be. guys and you may get some comments on here but like, i can get really good and they can get they can get pretty good i mean they can get like tolerable like really that's that's good dude that's an fdm printer you, you printed that and printed. you totally can tell it's 3d printed yeah. right on terrain doesn't matter it really sure. doesn't matter, yeah. right, at all. Like, no one's going to see those lines on the camera for you. Yeah. And even the perfect imperfections that you can see when you're actually playing it, you still, because you can actually make so much terrain with a 3D printer, like, you just get lost in the fact that you now have, like, not everyone's you. They don't have totes and totes and totes right. of, of and, terrain and from, like, 70 years of playing the games. <laughs> but, so, like... How old am I? Right. How fucking old do you think I am? Right, but I can But I've done, like, like I've printed, like, an entire graveyard, right? And right. I printed the whole thing out, which would have cost me probably like three or four hundred dollars if i actually went out and bought the it just cost you time instead and yeah but this has just cost me time right but yeah. that was when i was first getting into the hobby so i was totally nice. like i was like oh this is great i can print this thing out and do all this fun stuff and print like 50 because it's funny because originally i mean when, you, when we first met you were very gung-ho as like well i could just print that instead yeah right? exactly i was like, and now it's funny like, is yeah. three years later you you've definitely like, your opinion has definitely changed it has. because the convenience of having stuff that's finished having things that match your collection that's that's kind of impacted your enthusiasm. And yeah. I think fr from watching you kind of go through that like cycle, it feels like in the beginning you were excited about the technology and what it could do. Still am, yeah. And I've always had, but I've always had a, I've always had a feeling too that people who are who are excited about three D printing and that technology, the hobby side of it is almost their vehicle for enjoying the technology. That's exactly my point too. I'm not, I'm never going because you say it all the time. You should start a little shop, right? Because yeah. I do like to like make little, Tinker. like I do like to make my own little things, like my wound dials and my yeah. counters and stuff and like dick that. Butt widgets. This I is like, by the way, this is the creator of the dick butt widget. If for all of you are watching and ask, and I'm not going to start a store. store. <laughs> I will put the STL out on Thingiverse if you guys want me to do that. Comment below, and I'll put the and I'll put that out on Thingiverse if you guys want. Um, uh, or you can just make it yourself. It's, it's not, not hard. hard. You literally just take a meme thing and stick it. It's on not that hard. But I can, if you guys want, I'll put it out on on Thingiverse. <laughs> um, and I lost my train of thought there for a second. I don't know the, where I was going. The enthusiasm and versus yeah, the uh, technology is still there for me, right? It's yeah. it's still about like what can I make the printer do. Um, it's still about like working with different mediums and right. stuff like that to figure out like what you can accomplish versus what you can't. It's one of the reasons why I bought a resin printer. Yeah, um, which because, we'll get to in a second because yeah, that's the second half. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I bought the resin printer too because I liked, I do like the fact that if it's something I want, yeah, I can make it right. I can if it doesn't exist in the just, market, it and even, it's funny because for me that was the that was the arms in this Titan. Sure, and also these big frames is that this was something that didn't really exist in the market. And yeah. So, uh, to me, that's the power I think of the three D printing is that if there if it literally doesn't exist in the market, you can make it. You can make it. You can create it and have it happen. Yeah, and that's the thing too. Is but there's also things like too, like the the wound dials out there, right? Like I saw the Litco ones and I saw that, and then I, back in the day I was like, well, I can make these, and then I was like, can I make them better, right? And that kind give of give me a puzzle to solve. Yeah, give me a puzzle to solve, and it was like, and actually just coming up with the snap fit for that, right? It's right. hilarious too because I came up with a snap fit to actually put the two pieces together, um, which took a couple of trials and errors because it's literally a pressure fit, right? Yep. On yep. PL. PLA and not having the PLA snap. And it worked PLA really well. You made, you bas he basically made like an expanding button almost. Exactly, it, it yeah. It contracts as you push it through and it expands on the other side. Yep. It's almost like a grommet. Which you wouldn't think would I be guess. that hard, but the filament that you're working with, the, the levels that you're pushing it into, um, the fact that I was using PLA, super brittle kind of stuff like that, and the tolerances are super, super tight. Right. And we're talking about something that's super, super tiny, and the little button that it goes into is super, super small, and the little lip and you're stuff like that. You're almost making a rivet out of it. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And exactly. And getting it to the point where you can consistently do that without them breaking and you know coming together or whatever, that was a challenge, and that was actually super fun. And then I found myself actually like building the um, the miniature holder that GW came out with. Which one's that? Uh, it's like the... the oh, the, sorry, yeah. the handle, the, the yeah. mini grip. The those, mini grip. Yeah, which yeah. are amazing, by yeah. the way. I have a bunch of them now. Um, so I started like 3D designing those, right? And then I actually just went and bought one. I'm like, 
this is stupid. I can, <laughs> these are so much better than anything I could 3D print. Why would I 3D print them, that, right? The convenience factor. In action, and then I was right? like, well, it's not only convenience. Like I could, pro I could have probably spent like another two months trying to figure out the way to the do it because I was trying to even do it actually using tensioning within PLA without using any kind of spring mechanism or anything like that. But that sounds like the, another hobby. Yeah, that it makes was. Sense? Like the, the the how can I do this hobby? So for me, it's like it's kind of like people who love tinkering with cars. Guys yeah. like repairing cars, right? And, and it's funny because my, my, my kickback to that always is when you look at the success and popularity of a game like Gaslands, I think it's because it takes the DNA of someone who's already excited about something like sure, a car sure, sure. Yeah. and blends it with like being able to do it. It introduces with it. just something else you can do with the stuff you already and, have. And to me, exactly. And to me, that's this 3D printing. Which technology. is why Ferrari, I think, was so popular, right? It was right. a great story. I mean, it was a great story arc. It was great, like, things you could do with it. It was D&D &D for tabletop. But it gave you a vehicle to do all of this yeah, other stuff. Anything you wanted to, right? Like coming with dwarves or duck warriors if you want to do yeah. duck work, yeah. you know, that kind and of stuff. Make, and to make train, make, and make, to make train make and whatever. like do whatever you want to do. And it was, it, it was a, it was a, it was it was D and D but simplified and it was still and it was still tabletop. It was great. That's right. why I, I think that's why I took off. Taking two things and kind of mashing them together. So 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 that was my so that, so there's my first question, the first thing I want to talk about, which was why hasn't this taken over the market? And so from like listening to you talk, it sounds like it's partly to do with the fact that the technology itself is a hobby. Right now, yeah. So, yeah. so like it's it but it's also being used in the mainstream industry. Like right? it's it's oh, used yeah. to create miniatures all through the, like the NASA's is a perfect right example now. right like they're 3d printing so many so much other parts now because right. doing those one-off machines just to build that like one rocket Why, nozzle because you can ridiculous. print metal now can't you yeah they can oh yeah i can, I can print, print metal concrete. i can actually I, print I, metal. actually I saw, I saw there's a habitat from Yeti. They're, they're printing yeah you can print structures. concrete you can print metal yeah. um there's a couple different things that they're doing from the metal printing kind of stuff isn't like that, that. Plan, isn't that part of the plan for the moon base is that they're gonna yeah. three, they're gonna they're try gonna 3D, and, they're gonna they're, get there mine their own materials and then that's right yeah, well they're, they're trying because they because the thing they want to carry up is whatever the reactant works with moon rock yep to basically make moon rock concrete yeah basically build a structure seal it on the inside yeah build another build another thing and then build like a yeah, and they want to run like stuff on Mars, like the CO2 and stuff like right. that. They want to run and build fuel off of that and still use. Yeah, I mean, that's why bring along your resources if you can actually just make your own when you get there kind of deal. Because you can't build a factory, but you could bring a 3D printer that would give you the pieces. That could to, build to a factory. Do, to build that's a factory. the thing, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. You're building the robot to make the robot. Exactly. Basically. Yeah. That makes sense. It's so, that rip, that's that whole riprap um, type of mentality, right? right? So I have a Prusa. Um, which is probably like anybody who's watching, they'll, they'll know that Joseph Purse is like the man when it comes to 3D printers, especially right. FDM. He set like the standard. So most of like the Creality, for example, that's actually based on an i3, which was Purse's design. He makes all of his stuff uh, open source. So everything he builds is fully open source. Right. Um, some of his printers, some would might consider it expensive, but the dude like really knows FDM printing. Like mm -hmm. they have, they do a fantastic job. And that's one of the reasons why I bought one because it was more, more on the expensive side, I guess, when you look at those riprap type printers. But the dude like just introduces so much tech, and he brings yeah. so much to the market that you want to support that kind yeah. of that well, kind of inventor. And, and that's kind of my the second thing that I'm trying to like wrap my head around is that one of the things I think this can't take over or destroy the miniature gaming market is it's being used by the companies making miniatures already. Yeah. So they're producing stuff so fast using the same technology that, and because they employ professional Zeoverse sculptors and have professional casting facilities and use big professional machines. The at-home hobbyist almost can't keep up. It's a up. great point, though, too. Remember, we were talking about bridging and stuff like that, right? right? There's certain capabilities that certain 3D printers, they just can't do. Um, and never mind the quality. There's just some things. Like, you have to be able to design your models in a way that they can actually be 3D printed. Yeah, there's just a fit inside you, that box of the, the bed. That doesn't mean it's even going to print. Right. Like, you can have a model that you can take. So, for example, any one of those models you have there, right there. If you try to FDM print any one of those models just the way they are right there, um, you're going to have a bad time. Right. And the reason you're going to have a bad time is because the sheer amount of supports that you have to build off of any yeah, one of those things. Most of these were in like four or five pieces. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Five or six pieces. And you have the, to... The arms were, I think, the probably the most robust one. They were probably in like two or three pieces. Because yep. this is actually, this is a plastic roller titan. It's just yep, the arms. Yep, for sure. There. But if you look at them, like they're just a, like an FDM print, for example, it's just so many supports. Just right. insane amounts of supports <clears> to the to print that kind of stuff just to try to get it to maintain because again there has to be support structure in place for the 3d or printer it falls to work over while it's being, or while it's it falls printing. over yeah. or you miss a gap and then like the printer will actually just start printing in midair yeah, and yeah. that's when you get the octopus yeah, kind of spaghetti octopus kind thing. of stuff gotcha. um but then there's like different mediums that they print into right now so i know there's one 3d printer that's actually like gaining a lot of attention right now because it actually prints inside of a gel 
So, oh, so it's its own support. Basically. Yeah, so the all support those, is those actually arms. in it. So yeah. the, the nozzle actually goes down into the gel and prints itself and sort of kind of suspended animation. Yeah, yeah. So it's actually printing it inside of the gel. So it instantly cools and then it prints the object inside of the gel. Yeah, and the like, suspension value of the gel just gives exactly it just right. enough yeah. support. There's enough in there. There's yeah. enough viscosity in the gel huh. that it prevents the print from moving around. So like that's that's cool tech, right? When they could get the quality of that pretty high, you're going to see them start to make some amazing 3D printed stuff. Right. I mean, and that's three D printing organs for quite pricing now, right? Oh yeah, instead of growing the ear on the back of a mouse, they three yeah. D print it instead. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, yeah, the technology again. I, it may not be ten years, but the technology. Just to go back to what you're originally saying is, it may get to the point where this becomes a digital industry where they can sell the the models and make. Well, video more. games have made, made video games have made that jump. Like, yes. the, I think the last couple of video ga big video game releases, like big like 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 triple A games, you'd go to like your game store to buy it and pre order it, and it's just a code in a box. Yeah. Like you're not even getting like an actual like yeah DVD you do the digital download anymore. yeah you're just getting a digital because download. it costs so too like, much and there's no need for it right eventually you're going to see like Xbox and PS4 they're going to completely abandon drives altogether right absolutely so I I find it really interesting that like there's not going to be uh, I, don't, I don't think there's going to be a collapse you know what I mean because the stuff's already sort it's, of like you're probably decades away before you get to the point where the industry is disrupted that much right um, I mean we're going to be old I think there's there's going to be like the, an industry adaptation I don't think that what's going to happen is the industry is just going to sort of like collapse in on itself like a dying star what you're going to see is you're going to see uh, an industry that just sort of like takes a step to producing something else. Because that's usually what happens, right? Like, you know what it is? It's 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 gonna be so you remember when the nooks and shit came along, right? Right. So the e readers and stuff like that. It's gonna kill paper books? Uh eventually. But, but it, that was I think the it, it's gonna like, take people, longer. People were talking about that, well yeah. even it still never killed paper books, right? People still like that tangible type of deal that's going on. Right. So I don't and there will always be a market for people that just don't want to deal with it, right? Yeah. And that will always be there and they're happy to wait two days to get this stuff themselves and they don't want to deal with like, you know, getting that digital copy of it, right? But I think what you'll probably find is, or a better yet, like a, let's actually put it in the wargaming market, right? You can now buy your codexes digitally, right? right? I think what you're going to see is Games Workshop may, once the technology gets there to the point where, you know, people are actually starting to rip off, rip them off to the point where you can literally just go out and buy the STLs because people are just doing 3D scans on them yeah. to the point where, because the printers are there to actually catch up with it, it makes sense for GW then to be like, well, you can buy the digital copy or you can buy... Or it even comes with it. The physical, yeah. the physical or it even comes with it. Yeah, you buy the yeah. model, you get a, or you can It'll just buy it. It'll be like War one. Scrolls. They'll just get yeah, it away. Yeah, exactly right. Because you, you still have to have the technology. I don't think they'll it. ever give it away. I think they'll sell it as a, you can print I, as many of these as you I want. I wouldn't be deal. surprised, though, is if, if the 3D printing industry of like creating 3D printers gets to a certain level, they're gonna there's gonna be some encryption on them. So that's right? a good point. So they are so they they actually are like talking about that kind of stuff, right? right? So they sort of kind of run into that right now, like when you try to order like pr like um, like printed material, right? Mm -hmm. So if you ever went out to like Zoo like or something like that, a yeah, book yeah. Printed. they ask like you they for scan, rights. but yeah. they scan everything, right? And they check to see if you're infringing on anyone else's copyright, right? They have systems out there automatically, and at some point you may run into those scenarios where there's enough of a lawsuit because it's happening enough where they're like, hey, we want to actually put right protection on our stuff and not let you print them out unless you can provide a key that says well, when you it becomes it. When it becomes a, a feature in people's homes, when 3D printing becomes the thing that you do when you need a new garden hose yeah. attachment, you know what I mean? Like yeah. when it becomes the thing that you do when your kid wants a toy, yeah. there, then, then the, the courts will eventually catch up with the technology and they're going to make laws saying... You have to have. There's some very. You have to process. buy it, and you have the, to do the it printers like themselves will get regulated. But the printers at that point in time, you're not going to have these. You're not going to have these like cheap creality ones. You're not. Gonna, those right. things will not exist because the market will have to. You're going to have to put some substantial investment in a machine that can print perfect every time. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. And when you get that's, to that point, it, well, because you're, what you're talking about now is you're talking yeah. about the Star Trek replicator. Right? Yeah. You, literally, literally, when you like, buy your house, it comes with a replicator. Yeah, it's yeah, built exactly. into it's built the house. In. You're talking, and, and I mean, we're not far off. It's just the technology needs to be. I mean, uh, the computing power behind it, it has to be smarter than it currently is. It has to know how to make a thing. It has to be more resilient. I wouldn't up. say yeah. smarter. It has to be more resilient. the The process is actually relatively simple for what it's doing. It's literally drawing a line, and then moving so increments. I guess not, so what I'm talking you know, about is when you're 3D printing, like let's say a new foundation for a house. Sure. It has to be. It can't just be the same foundation every time. It has to adapt to whatever it's being put onto. Yeah, you have to know, you know like I mean? the like, foundation you're building on and stuff. It like, has to be smart enough to know what the water table is. Like, there's, there's. Well, if, you would code that into it. Things. You would tell it. Like, you, I've got like my base layer. So, a perfect example when you print like resin, for example, right? You're gonna cure the base layer more because you want that. You want it to adhere to the build plate. 
Right. So you're actually going to put more of a cure on it because you want no flex and you want to make sure that sucker's adhered, right? And you're going to do it for the first couple of layers because you want to make sure you've got a solid platform that you're going to build on, right? After that, you're actually going to start to decrease that cure rate and the increments because you want more fidelity yeah. at that point in time, right? So you're going to do the same thing when you're building a house or whatever like that. You're, you're going but to the, change the material. Is, I don't want to know how to do that stuff. That's, you don't. So you want to, the industry yeah, exactly. Bigger. I don't want to know how to do that stuff. The machine needs to know Well, it's going back stuff. to what I was saying before. Like you go on Amazon, you're like, oh, I want this garden hose attachment, five bucks. And then you wake up the next day and it's in the printer. Yeah. Right? That's what you want. That's where, and that's where I think that if, if the, if there, there's like a middle zone where an industry could be threatened by a technology like this. Yeah. But on the other side of that zone is once it gets so prolific that everyone has one, it's also going to be deeply regulated. Yes. Because, because when money's involved, yep. courts get involved. When, and when courts get involved, money, yeah. the technology starts. I mean, it's, it's the same way like cars were not regulated when they were invented. Very true. Right, cars didn't have any kind of laws about them. You need a license. You got in a car and you drove. Well, the three D printers. You could, you could drive over a hundred people. You know what I mean? And, and there was no, there was no laws really. The three D printer is a perfect example. A lot of the maker stuff is actually a perfect example because, uh, like the like the resin printer I have, um, that a lot of people that you know that have resin printers, yeah. they buy like a cheap five hundred dollar resin printer, right? So cheap and five hundred dollars for the average hobbyist aren't words that go together. Well, when, <laughs> everything's relative, right? Everything I, I get is relative. It, what I'm saying is, if but when you look when thing, you like, look at a resin printer that's five hundred dollars versus right. like what an app like a form three costs like three thousand yeah, dollars, yeah, it's yeah. relatively like a professional cheap. grade one that the companies right now are using to make the masks. Yeah, but you say majors. professional grade for the yeah. forms, and that's not technically even professional, right? right. Like the they're, ones they're, that they're GW about uses, twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, twenty thousand dollars, like yeah. Sig boxes or whatever, and like they print like amazing, and they're like bulletproof or whatever, yeah, and yeah. but they run with proprietary stuff that you have to buy, and every refill is like yeah. two grand or something like that. Right. So it's just the resin you're dumping into that thing is like fifteen thousand dollars and then they can be pretty expensive it depends on what they're trying to do right but they're looking for something completely different than what i'm looking yeah. for right they're making masters and all kinds of fun stuff masters like that. that have to be perfect because the copies exactly have to be right and you know they're also they're going in and they're printing like full-on sprues i would never print a sprue of something i'd print the components just with the rafts they right. need to live and that would be well that, actually right? what they're probably doing is going right to cutting molds they're they probably could be. Be, the, the, the prototypes might be might be getting done but if they're doing steel injection molds they're going right from the STL to laser cutting. Yeah, they totally could. Yeah, that's the kicker on that. They're not even. They're not even. They're only printing it to make sure that it works. Yeah, well, that's the kicker though. <laughs> but they may want to print it all on the sprue too, and then yeah. actually snip it and actually see touch how this. it is. They, they have, they how is it to interact with them and stuff like that too? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I think we're in a we're in a funny place though, where it it sounds like the technology is moving really fast, but because of that, the, the other half of that is these companies are using the technology to keep ahead of people too. They are. So so there's the second the second thing I want to talk about, so we've, we've talked a bit about is it going to destroy the industry? It's not. Uh, okay. <laughs> that's your, that's <laughs> not your, anytime soon. So there's, there's, that's there's my Mike's, opinion. Mike's it's definitely not, it's not I don't think it's going to, yeah. It's also enabling the industry to do the second thing I want to talk about, which is the absolutely breakneck speed or breakneck speed with which uh, releases currently happen in the, in the tabletop industry. And I don't just mean in wargaming, I mean board game kickstarters like the the fact that 3d printing is allowing people to to create these board game kickstarters like for instance i just got the batman gotham city chronicles one with hundreds of miniatures in it like hundreds of miniatures and the turnaround time for those hundreds of miniatures like if if you told me 150 miniatures could be delivered inside a year all uniquely sculpted you know what i mean in plastic back in 2001 i just said you were insane because yeah. the, the technology just didn't exist but you look at gw right the stuff that they're producing now versus what they were producing five years ago right, right. and that's directly because of the 3d printing technology and the fact that they can design all that stuff out yeah. prototype as much of it as they possibly can touch it feel it play with it even field test it if they want to to see how well it goes with crazy ass detail, but with, not just GW too. I th the thing is that this well, is kind of level, but this is but leveling yeah. the playing field because you can rent a zebra sculptor now. Yeah, and there's tons of them that are basically you can go on Fiverr, man, and get a well, zebra. That's it. Yeah, but th these people are people who have the talent because there's a talent pool out there in the video game industry of people who train for ten years for jobs that no longer exist in the video game industry. Right? There was a way overly qualified talent pool of people that came out of school thinking there's going to be a million video game jobs, yep. and they've all been cannibalized, and the studios have all fallen apart, and there's lots of people looking for work. So there's a talent pool moving into the tabletop industry of people that design 3D models for video and games. And for some of them, they can do it super quick. Ex exactly. Especially if you get someone that specializes that's in specific things. that's all you know how to things. do. Like, I build robots. <laughs> yeah. I can build robots in, like, five hours. I can build you the craziest looking robot ever in five hours, And we can right? slice it, print it, and all of a sudden you have a, a four and a half inch tall miniature. Done. And that's, and, and what, that's crazy to me because that... To me, that is the biggest impact I see this 3D printing and, and, and digital to the tabletop mm -hmm. 
like bridge, because that's really what these 3D printers are, is they're a bridge between the two. Yep. Th that's the thing that I personally have felt impacted by, not even owning a 3D printer, Yeah. right? It's the fact that there is so much out there now that you can have access to because the time between, even for traditional spin casting most stuff in metal, this technology has made it so that you can go from computer to resin masters, like, yep. which is the next type of printer we should talk about, to the tabletop in in like a week. Yeah, like it, you can you can do it in a day. You can do it in a day. You can do it in a day. It's all depending on like what resources and skills you have so, to actually accomplish it. So I think most people are familiar with the way that these filament printers work. The they're, FDM, they're, yep. the, the FDM stuff. They're layering. Tell me more about so like for the people listening. Tell me about the resin printers. What's the difference in these, these two types of printers? How do they like? How are they different? Because one is a nozzle squirting correct lines of melted plastic basically. What are these, like, why is the quality so much higher on these resin miniatures? Sure. And was it doing differently? So it's basically, so when you're squirting out, uh, when you're squirting out the plastic on an FDM, right, it can only get so small, right? right. And that's because you're literally like squirting plastic out under pressure. It's like making spaghetti noodles. Basically, yeah, yeah, right? Um, and so there's only there's only so much you can get out of that, right? The way the resin actually works, and it can be a couple different ways that resin will work, but we'll talk about SLAs and LCDs, right? So the way they actually work is on, a, on an SLA, it will actually use um, a laser, right? For example, and it will do the same thing pattern-wise that the FDM is doing, but it's just drawing a laser in resin, right? Okay. So what happens is, is that the build plate on, so the build plate on an FDM printer, you start on the bottom and you build up, right? Yep. Um, and you're just laying lines on top of it and that's when you get to the top, you're done. On a resin printer, it's actually the opposite, right? So the build plate starts on the bottom in a vat of resin, uh, UV curable resin, and it lifts up. So you're actually adding layers to it as it actually goes up. So it's kind of like that scene in Hellboy where uh, the, the, the big pool of blood, what's his name, just rises up out of it basically. Uh, sure. Rasputin. Sure, like so line it, by it, line. But there's right? like a plate on the top of his head pulling him out sure, of Sure, exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So, um, and what happens is, is the build plate goes down and it goes down like extremely close to um, the vat. FEP. It's called yeah. a FEP. I wanted to say FAP, but it's called a FEP. And it squeezes out all the resin until there's just a tiny little, like, we're talking micron size um, layer of resin in there, and it cures that, right? right? And then it peels that off the FEP, because it's attached to the build plate, yeah. goes up, lets a little bit of it drip off, and then it goes back down, and it does it again. So the laser is actually going around and drawing the layers that it wants to get on there, right? right. So it goes a quick path, draws a line, and then it picks up and it goes back down and does the same thing again. So it's um, drawing the outline, basically. It's shooting the outline into exactly. the resin while it pulls out. Mm -hmm. Got it. So that's exactly what it's doing. On and uh, on the LCD one that we're talking about, what that actually does is it actually shoots UV light up through an LCD screen. So yeah. basically what happens is, is it, the LCD screen will block off the pieces that it doesn't want the UV light to get through, and it just shines the light all the way up through there. So uh, you the whole layer... For that all particular once, print, basically. it's all done so at it's one not, time. It's not going around with the laser. It's just, a, yep, big it's just pill, a pillar of light. Basically. Yeah, exactly right. So, And the reason they're more accurate is because you're getting down into much, much smaller layers. Layer. Well, not not even the layers, but yeah, that's true too. But also the fact like the dimensionality of it is so much smaller, right? Yeah, it's not a nozzle. Exactly right. So you're limited by the resolution of your LCD screen, and then you're limited by the... By the Focal size. The, exactly, the laser. the laser, yeah. So that's why you get much, much higher resolution out of a resin printer, right? Because you, you uh, there's like no striation lines on these these Immortal Kings miniatures. These have been done on a great high-end printer. Yeah, so those were done um, super, they probably took a, a pretty long time to uh, print out. But yeah, they were done at a super high resolution. And the resin can actually get extremely high to the point where you cannot see the layer lines. And that's what they're using to make masters, mm -hmm. this stuff for miniatures in general. So Yeah, they're like probably using SLA so like specifically Infinity for percent, that. Yeah. For instance, where yeah. you're seeing these, like, these 3D designs early on, yeah. they'd be using something like this to create create their masters which sure. they would then used to make silicon molds they would cast the metal in which then your blister pack that shows up in the shop yeah so if i'm getting any of the terminology wrong i'm only going to be slightly wrong if i'm on any of this stuff just i'm in the you ballpark did, you so. also flew in from the uk last night and, and i also like did fly hours. in last night so it's, it's been a pretty long day um but yeah don't crucify me on that one but i'm in the ballpark and i think you'll all agree on that one so um but yeah the resin printer but th there's a flip side to the resin printer though too right the resins that we currently use they're uv cured right they're technically non-toxic but not really right um 
So you can't drink them. You're not technically even supposed to touch the resin because, yeah, yeah it's, it's badness it can happen to you if you get exposed to it too much. Um, and they produce fumes. Every single one of them produce. I don't give a shit what you say. Every <laughs> single one of them produces fumes. Um, and some people have really bad reactions, reactions to them, to them yeah. right? So you need for, almost a dedicated space. For yeah, this. you need a, a dedicated printer, space with ventilation. This isn't something you want in your basement. It is. This is not an FDM. Room. So technically, even on the, I mean, keep in mind, even on the FDM, you're you're melting plastic, right? So I mean, let's be there's honest. There's some kind of solvent. There's going in there's there. stuff going on there, yeah. right? The resin printer is nasty stuff, right? Um, some people don't like some people like can bathe in it and they'll be perfectly fine or they'll appear perfectly fine get, like, headaches like and... i get headaches um i can't taste things for a while well never mind um, this is an unregulated technology and it's completely so, they keep in mind though too right so, so even if it was dangerous they are they obligated to tell us now they'll give you they do give you <laughs> spec sheets on the resin right yeah. so they'll tell you like what's in there and stuff like that but and, even but that's in the liquid resin while it's in the bucket Correct. Not what's, Not what's actually happening into a chemically like this thing, right? Now, Form Labs probably has some technical write up on or whatever, but Form Labs even tells you like their stuff needs to be in a ventilated system. Yeah, yeah. You know, that whole it's nine like, yards. Don't have to spray paint. <laughs> yeah, exa exactly. Don't be spray paint in your there's house, a, kind of thing, right? There's literally, there's literally on the spray paint things, it'll say like, do not smoke. Do not like, this. like don't do this to your spray paint. Don't smoke yeah, your spray paint. Yeah, so, and that's, you know, they have to be cleaned. Um, you're, again, you're supposed to wear gloves. Um, their, sh their supports are completely different than FDM supports right. um, because you have to you have to adjust for the fact that you're actually causing uh, actual um, forces when you have to actually peel off the FEP. So what actually happens is is when you cure it, you're curing it to the this FEP sheet, which is like the best way to look at it. It's sort of kind of like a it's just a clear plastic, but it's like a Teflon type of deal, so okay. it doesn't things don't stick to it as much, but it still sticks. So actually, you know your print is actually going successful because you can hear it popping because it's actually pulling off the FEP, see, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's how you know it's actually doing that. So you've got to build your supports in a completely different mindset because you have to so you have to overcome for you though. Uh, they can, but it's not usually great, right? So you it's have not smart to, enough a printer. Yet you've to got to look at how you know how your printer reacts based on the part that you're putting in there. So even more than the FDM ones, there's a certain level of like familiarity with the technology the resin ones need. Yep. And there's uh, there's also a thing called hollowing, right? Right. So these guys build internal supports because they have to. Those guys don't need it. internal supports, right? So what you actually want to do is you actually want to hollow out your your resin prints. One, because resin's expensive, it's right? It's going to save you. It's material. going to save you resin. Yeah. But two, the curing process, right? We talked about this a little bit earlier. And the fact that, because you, what you have to do once this resin is actually printed, you have to cure it. Mm -hmm. So FDM, when it's printed, it's done, right? You can do with it whatever you want to do. Right. The resin has to be cured under UV light so that it's like permanently set in place, right? So you have to control what your curing process looks like to make sure that you don't get cracks or that you don't have dimensionality, dimensionality shift, whatever the hell. So it doesn't like shift on you because you over cured one part versus not curing it up, okay. another part kind of deal. Um, so you've got to take all that in consideration when you're doing these. So resin's much more complicated than FDM. So that's why this is the one that the industry is using to speed up their production process. Because it looks like this is what's being used to make masters. Yeah, and this to, also to prints like, faster. Resin also prints faster, much, right. much faster. Right, but, but it also has a higher failure rate if you don't get it right. Uh, the, the thing is, is once you get your resin dialed in correctly, it will print perfectly every time. Every your time. failure rate is actually going to come into like how you built your supports, Got how it. you so hollowed it's, it's actually your model. The, your human error. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how you hollowed your model and stuff like that. But their failure rate is like way, way low, unless you have mechanical failure. Right. Like the LCD goes out or the laser goes out. It's really like interesting because it seems like for like home use, the resin ones are obviously a bigger dollar investment. What's, yes. what's the difference cost-wise between like a base model resin one and a base model? You can get an FDM printer for a hundred bucks. Don't yeah. get that one. Uh, spend 199 <laughs> and get a Creality because uh, you can do the support for if the you're FDMs. you're doing terrain or whatever, the that's The support for the FDM, yeah. especially Creality stuff is like phenomenal, right? And But the resin's catching up as far as support-wise goes too. But like a cheap resin printer, like the cheapest I've ever spent on a resin printer is about 500 bucks. Yeah. And that would be for like a Photon or something like so, that. So now if you're looking at, so and that's the thing is, if you want like, like GW quality, you can get Prince. GW quality with that. Right. That's but now you're looking at a base cost before you buy any resin, you learn anything. Five hundred bucks. Around okay, about five hundred bucks. So so you can maybe right now the, the high the, the, the quality you want basically if you're printing miniatures. So this is what people have in their head, I think. Yes. When they say I'm gonna 3D print all my miniatures and have an awesome You're gonna have to do a res resin. It's already it's already basically an army's worth of dollar value before you start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another way of printing. But something. think about it though too. Resins have smaller build plates, yeah. like much, much smaller build plates. Because again, again, you've got so that the size pressure. of a cell phone, right? Uh no, 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 no. So my 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 resin, I think, is 
like the, a six by eight. Okay, so I remember the one. The one I think you described. It was like a, it was like a, a four by six. I think a four by eight. A four by six, four by eight, even there it was so, the one that Mike described. Yeah, 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 it's about yeah, the size yeah. of a big cell phone. Yeah, yeah, like a really big cell phone. Yeah, yeah. For, uh, yeah. Because I mean, if you get like a Note or something like that, for yeah. sure. Um, and you can actually cram quite a bit on there. But again, it's that you should get an angle too. Like, you can well, here's the thing. So when you print in these, you actually want to print at angles because there's a couple things you have to take. In. Again, it's all about planning your print when you get with these guys. Is you also have to build in drain holes. Yeah. Um, for one, and you have to build in pressure holes. So you want the gravity to, to leak. You want the gravity to take the want. extra yeah. resin out of the thing, but you also had to build in pressure holes because what will happen is, let's say you're building, like let's say you're printing a box, mm -hmm. right? So what happens when you print a box and you're printing the outside of it, but then you have this big gaping hole in the middle of it? Right. It creates a suction when it actually goes to pull it off of FEP. Right, so what that's actually going to do is it's going to cause a massive amount of strain on your supports. Yeah. So that can actually pull them away. So, so one of the ways you get around that is you put a hole when you start it out in the base and your supports on the top of the box, yeah. so that when it pulls, the pressure's got to you know release somewhere point. to go. Yeah. yeah, somewhere to go. So so if I was putting a 28 mil miniature, what's the average print time for one of these resin miniatures? So the beauty of resin, or at least on the LCD and even on the SLAs for that matter, is they all take the same amount of time. So right. you can fill the build plate with as much with stuff like as you want to, yeah, and yeah. it will print in the same amount of time as it takes to print for one. Cool. So because that's what I'm, that's what I'm curious about is how why is this stuff happening so fast? Yeah, because you can do that. It is because if I so let's say I am doing like a, a, a you know a big board game Kickstarter and there's 150 models. If I can fit 10 on each plate, yeah, it's 15 prints. Yeah. Once the sculpts are done, yeah. ZBrush, and I can be touch testing. I can yeah. be sending them off to like get you know cast in vinyl in China or cut and cast in the UK or the yeah. United States. So the time the time is a loaded question, right? Because it depends on your layer height, your detail, your printer, all that fun stuff like that, the technology that you're using. But but, but like that guy right there. Yeah. The biggest but, barrier now is the sculpting, yeah. not the print, not the getting them. The ready printing to cast. is so it's getting like storage for servers, right? Yeah. No one gives a shit anymore. <laughs> storage is free almost practically right. when you get it uh, into the scheme of things and stuff like that. So no one even thinks about that when they're actually getting to that scale of things. So no one actually really even thinks when you're into that level level of production like how long is this thing going to take to print yeah like because they'll have enough basically. things and they'll just run and they'll pack the build plate with as much as they well, can three or four printers going at the same time and they'll just get what they need to get out in that run kind yeah. of deal yeah so i mean it still takes time though don't get me wrong like that guy right there if you printed the whole thing like one of the big guys i mean it could easily take 18 to 20 hours to get that right. printed For that one minute sure. but if you imagine like you can have an entire kit Squad or printed guys, yeah. in 20 in 20 hours right that's a, especially from a production standpoint to like get stuff tested cast, out there. Yeah. It's great, right? That's huge for them. For a hobbyist though, is that like, is it worth your time to wait versus going and buying it right. type of deal? You know, yeah. that's do I, for, do I want like 24 hours and then clean everything for my 10 space brains? So and then to clean it and then brains. wash it and cure it. And <laughs> or I'd be clipping about in like in three Oh, hours and by the way, fine. I had to put drain holes in. So I got to fill those in with mill putt. Yeah, and yeah. oh, by the way, I had to support. So I got to go shave off all my supports to make I, it look I nice. I do wonder what this, this like acceleration is doing for the economy of tabletop though, because there are so many new products out there. I now. think it's huge. Like, look at 3D printable scenery. That company's like exploded. Yeah, yeah. Well, over what, the last I, what I'm saying years. is, as a consumer, there's so many places for my dollar to go now. I'm almost, I'm almost like choice paralyzed because the, the impact it's having on me is yeah. because stuff can get to market so much faster than it used to be able to in a quality that I'm really happy with. Yeah. Right. So it's not, it's not like I'm looking for like the best sculptors anymore because. Well, you know, in, in the difference, you know, really highly trained, like talented sculptor and uh, uh, like in, like 20 years ago and a ZBrush sculptor today, the ZBrush sculptors are using like pre-generated assets a lot too. Yeah, so they, and they run look good circle around, around the sculptors just because like that sculptor is going to take weeks to get to where he needs well, to go his, to. Well, he's limited by the human eye, yeah. right? A phys someone physically pushing putty is limited yeah. by the human eye. Whereas the detail level that you can get to, and actually we're talking about this in the contrast paint video, is that the you can create details in ZBrush that the human eye can even hand can yeah can't even there. get to yeah right so you get to these like super detailed miniatures and the quality of the miniatures are 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 crazy the proportions are really good the dynamics are really good you can cut them in, in ways that you can get poses you couldn't making do assembly a much much better process too right uh, and so like we're kind of spoiled for choice like it feels like the industry not isn't just accelerating in terms of the what technology is making possible but it's also accelerating in terms of just the, the amount of options we now have available, where like there's there's so many companies coming and going out of the market yeah. and arriving via crowdfunding and then just like just doing a, a single one-off. Like Kingdom Death Monster, for instance, they've made one really super high quality product, right? They made Kingdom Death Monster. And I don't, I don't know if they're ever gonna make anything else ever again, but, yeah, they, sure. but they but this technology has clearly helped them 
to create this one really high end product. Yeah. And and they've they've exist basically in the in the tabletop market now because of it. Yep. And there's companies that have cut their teeth on making these you know one off Kickstarters like Kumi or Not wouldn't be Kumi or Not without Zombie Side, and Zombie Side had so many miniatures, uh, and so many different miniatures as stretch goals all made possible because you could create that amount relatively of things quick. relatively yep, quickly. Exactly, right? yeah. You could do it all in, in digital. Well, it's got that fail design. fast kind of approach to it too, right? So they can get out there and they can find out what actually is going to sell or sell or not going to sell. So they don't have to invest. And well, all the tooling. The digital, and it's out funny because the digital part of it seems to be what's being sold on in crowdfunding. It can be. You, you see pictures of the ZBrush sculpts. You don't see pictures of the miniatures very often. It depends. Like some of them you can see it, some of them well, you can't. Like sometimes you know they'll invest. It's usually after it's funded yep. and they're trying to kick it for another 30 days. You start to see the painted miniatures show up because they're like, oh shit, this is really going to happen. Well, no, what and you'll so they see is they print some, them and they get someone to paint them up. Like and they for them like three D printing, like three D printing scenery, right? Like those guys have three D printers, yeah. and they'll actually and they actually three D print everything that they design because so they want to make sure that it will actually print the way they want it to. Because they're three D printing for three D printing scenery, I think is what they're. They're a New Zealand company. They're they're pretty legit. Hey, my name is Mike. Talk to Ash. I'll take free STLs. <laughs> um, uh, and I've already bought a if bunch he, of your stuff. He's going to show up with a box uh, of shit I have to pay yeah. next time he's so, here. <laughs> um, but they 3D print all of their own stuff before they actually like really release it because yeah. their whole goal is that you don't have to print with supports. So oh, they actually neat. design okay. their stuff so you don't have to print with supports, which is fantastic. That's yeah. actually huge because supports well, are saves horrible. You, it saves you filament. It, it saves, saves you filament, time whatever. for yeah. cleaning up, the whole nine yards like that. So... Um, but what you'll actually find though too is like people will use something like Shapeways, right? So the guys who are That's starting expensive, the expensive. Yeah. It is the reason it's expensive is because time. These right. things take time. Some it's, and the resin ones especially because it's not even like oh send me your STLs and I'll just resin print your stuff. It's like I got to cut it, I got to hollow it, I got to build the yeah. supports for it, I, well, I got to print it, on, clean it, cure some, it. I bought some shit from a Shapeways store back yeah. for horse rider. Yeah, I think it was like some extra sniper rifles to make like recon teams. And maybe it was like some just some like I think it was um, flat like uh, yeah. alpha omega symbols, yeah. just like just like to put on rhinos and stuff. And it was like for like ten of those symbols, I probably put like a hundred bucks because they printed them in resin. Yeah, and that resin stuff just takes longer to do, man. It's it's a it's a and you probably how was it like a year ago you bought those? No, this is like three or four years. Oh ago. yeah, so it Way would even more because it was, it was yeah. bits that didn't exist basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it would have been even more expensive back then. But it's still like the resin stuff just takes more effort, right? Yeah. The FDM stuff you can usually get a little bit cheaper, but again, the FDM stuff I think is more reserved for terrain. Right. Yeah. So At and that's point. what 3D 3D printable scenery. If I'm getting, I think it's 3D printable scenery. I hope it's 3D printable scenery. <laughs> um, I thought it was just printable scenery. It could be printable. They're new in New Zealand. If you type it in, it's like the first thing that pops up in Google. <laughs> um, yeah, they, their stuff is amazing. Um, and a Thingiverse is a great resource to find stuff as well right. for that stuff. Yeah. So I, I, it's it's interesting because those are to me those are the two big impacts that I've seen. That's there's this like there's the doom and gloom of this is going to destroy the industry. But then the flip side of that is that this technology has accelerated the amount and quality of things that have come The out. only thing I haven't seen yet and I'm waiting for is things to get a little bit cheaper. Um, because they are able to produce so many models right now. I don't think the cost to produce outside of the R&D stuff has gone down. Um, who shares so profits, much. man? Nobody's yeah, yeah, no, I get profits. that though too. Like, but some can, of us, if you can run a super some of us business. would like to see it carry over. But at well, the that's end of why I think the industry is going to end up in a place where it starts to get regulated because yeah. right now it's a it's a super free market, yeah. right? Like, and even the technology behind the printers is a well, super it's free rife market. with uh, IP like theft. Too. It's true. You can go on Thingiverse right now. You can print out GW Knights right now on Thingiverse and don't do it. But you can print out like GW. But like I mean, like video game night. assets, like ever, like basically. The video game right assets video are not games. as great, so you have to be careful with that kind of stuff. I get that because get, it's got well because it has a, a textured skin over top. No, of it. No, no, no. It's not only that. You, you're gonna find so like there's a difference between just downloading like an asset from a video game and something that was actually designed, designed. to be three D printed. I um, mean, that's just not even with the supports and stuff like that. You're gonna find a lot of anomalies and stuff like that. The same level of IP theft is going to the video game for sure as is going to. Well, look at the Fallout stuff. The Fallout stuff's a perfect example, yeah. right? Almost every <clears throat> asset from Fallout is on Thingiverse. And most of them will actually print okay. Yeah. Um, and usually your slicer will fix most of the issues for you automatically. Right. Um, but like everything, and that all like really transcended well into the 3D printing kind of stuff. And you you know, because I printed some stuff for you. Yeah. And um, not as, oh, I did print a shit ton of stuff for you, but you never got it. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, but I mean, you're going to see more of that kind of stuff too. And I think what you may even find though as well is they may actually start making the assets available for sale for sale too as a, because as like a, yeah well because yeah, I mean there's do. I guess there's two there's two like that was my last my third thing is like where does it go from here yeah because uh, we've we've seen a technology that is both is both being heralded as the doom of the industry but also is the thing currently accelerating the industry massively and and I don't know if it becomes 
something that they 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 push back against by just embracing it because that's entirely possible like do you just embrace the idea that everyone can create physical objects and and start selling your stuff and just not worry that you hope that because it's basically pure profit if it's already been made that that just counteracts the amount of piracy I think you're going to see DLC. I think that's going to happen, and that makes sense, because you want to protect right. your IP, right? And the last thing you want is for people just being out there and like... If you don't defend it, you can't defend <clears> it. Anymore. Exactly right. right. And the last thing I think you want out there is folks like printing a bunch of low-quality stuff and then like rebranding it as, hey, GW stuff. This yeah. is like branded as GW stuff. That seems like it's, but that seems like it's pretty easy. Like if you start a store of just like knockoff 3D printed GW train, they have a very simple legal case to shut you down. They do, but right. I think <laughs> what you're going to find with like if it's in China or whatever, right? Yeah, it's way yeah. more difficult stuff coming through the blip, the back channels and stuff like that. And that's usually where it starts, right? And then it gets out of control and then how much are you fighting? Stuff like that. So I think from a DLC perspective, it makes sense for them to do it. Yeah. And I think the smartest thing for them to do it is to embrace it in a, in a way that's good for their business, right? It's not going to get... It's not going to get worse. It's going to get better as far as the quality and the availability and stuff goes, right? That's true. That's that's two um, things that they're always going to have against them is the technology is going to keep marching forward. Yeah, it's which they want low, too, but they yeah. want that too for themselves because it makes their jobs that much easier. I mean, it's going to get to the point where the 3D print process may actually catch up to injection molding where it can actually keep up with it from a scale perspective. Do you see in 20 years that a, a Warhammer store is just like four big 3D printing bays and a big like touchscreen menu? I don't know if that, that will ever like happen, pan, but I think rack? you may have... Have, like you can get any model within four hours so like there's maybe like a back room basically with like a pod like warehouse and you can just go in any model within four hours yeah like a ship to store and then they print well, on demand so it's funny i can see you know what i can see print on demand well, so, i can see you so order that, it and they ship it to you here, in two here's days. a big thing with that so so my my big thing is that that would allow so so i always think as a business person what is my current level of stock in the warehouse and SKUs? because that's where my brain always goes sure it, I, I would see that technology as allowing people to continue to sell their entire range of models forever yeah. with no warehousing requirement, shelf requirement. You can basically always have your back catalog available in the back room on like a, a, a pickup in store order. Well, imagine this though too. Think about it this way. So the print on demand feature, if they can get to the point where it's so cheap to actually print on demand, they don't have to maintain that inventory anymore. Yep. That all goes away. Um, hobby stores, I think, are going to suffer from this. Um, because what if you a can, hobby store could buy one? But if the you know hobby store I mean? could like, buy one, sure. That's a, that's a big thing. And they right could print, uh, they could print a range of models. That's what I mean, yeah. right? So you could you could buy into it and have your own in, in store printer. For sure, and, and you can show and you up in four hours and have it. Yeah, yeah. Like that's range. entirely possible. Well, that print on demand feature, I think, is where you're going to get to the point where they're going to be able to produce more models. You're going to be able to get your stuff super fast. You're yeah. going to pay a nominal fee to get that stuff out there. Every hobby um, source thing of our stuff. And exactly right. Yeah. And I think that would be like a cool way to go. Because I think what's going to happen though, call it the next 20 or 30 years, the machine that can print perfect every time, all the time, it's still going to be probably pretty expensive, right? Plus maintaining the supplies to actually do the printing. And to, honestly, it can get to the point, like they have actual like um, inkjet 3D prints now where they can actually print the color while and actually add it to like clear fil filament to That's actually right, yeah. print the thing. Just, just so where you can actually go online, design what you want your Space Marines to look like, Crazy. order them, show up, and they're fully done. Like fully based, fully done. Yeah. Um, with your color scheme of your choice. To me, that's the industry embracing this technology. Yeah. And and instead of like trying to fight piracy, you you cr you you build you build out more of the convenience factor. I think that's the thing. Because right? like, like, yeah. it's because everything. I, I don't think this technology is going to stop being toxic to have in your house or inconvenient to have to maintain or require you to the go toxicity to the is like, going to be a hard one there's a bunch of that so so if it just becomes a service mm -hmm. and the industry embraces it as a service you've got a way of basically stepping around the piracy aspect because ultimately people are fucking lazy and and, and cheap yeah they and are if you don't have to if you can just if you can just have it shipped to the store and be ready to pick up you're ultimately probably going to do that unless like we said earlier your the technology is your hobby. Yeah, the hobby. Right? The I think those guys are it. always going to exist. There's yep. going to be people and out they there will. that the printing is actually the hobby, and yep. the and the the hobby part, the Warhammer part, is the vehicle. Hundred percent agree with you uh, that they're enjoying their hobby with. Yeah. Right. Like it's like guys who are engineers in real life who build model trains. The model trains are just another thing to engineer. Yeah. Right. Or they build their own computers or yep. whatever that is. Where it's this is just another thing to, for me to employ the skill that I really love 100%. to have. Um, and I'd be excited to do that. I would love to be able to to be able to like. 
let's say they go back and take the whole 90s, 80s catalog of like Warhammer miniatures. Scan them in and you can Scan print them in, scan the masters, and then I can walk into a, like a, a GW store or a retail that's paying a licensing fee and be like, I'd like to order one of every Ali Morrison squig made right. in like the 1980s yeah. and show up when they're just there printing a box for me. Sure. That'd be super cool. Yeah, and I think I think the the bespoke stuff I think is actually where you're going to get in there where you can actually get into the point well, where... There's no storage. There's no, in, there's no overhead. There's no, there's no uh, stock There's no maintain. packaging. There's like all of that stuff goes away. You're your business model becomes so much easier at that it's point. It's miniatures. Time. Exactly. <laughs> and I think eventually they're going to get there. And I and I think GW is getting way more in touch with the gamers, I think, now versus where they were like well, 15 or 20 years ago. Well, their front-facing staff definitely are. They, they are hired, like... They've yeah. hired people who look and talk like yeah. their customers exactly. to be the face of their business. Yeah, and I mean, that's the thing, though, too. And I'll tell you this, like, just to go back, because I think it's an interesting point, like, um, versus, like, terrain and stuff like that like when i was we were just in warhammer world right the only thing i bought when i was there was terrain like the only thing i bought was terrain um and it's just because it was easier for me to just have it and get what i wanted than it was for me to print it out and the guy who owns like what and i could print them i could easily print those and no (laughs) one would judge me and they'd look pretty decent on the table and no one would say anything and i bought them simply because it was convenient. They were there, and it was the price I wanted to pay. Gotcha. And you know that's the trade-off that you pay for all this stuff. And eventually, and I think for the next ten years, that's that's still going to be. But there. I don't think you're going to stop three D printing stuff either. No, hell because no. the technology it's a fun, it's a thing you like tinkering. I want to buy another three D printer now, yeah. and I haven't touched my three D printer in two months. <laughs> <laughs> just by talking about them. Yeah, just um, yeah, because that's just the it's it's that part of the hobby, right? I have three yeah. hobbies, and that's one of the hobbies that yeah, I have. Yeah, so exactly. So yeah. I, I I'm I'm really happy with this conversation. I, I think that this was a uh, a good look at at the current state, some theories about the future. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to it too uh, and watching on YouTube. So big thanks for Mike coming in. Yeah. And for you guys listening, um, tuning in the podcast and watching this on YouTube. Um, and we'll see you for another Let's Talk uh, on another topic. I think the next one's going to be about competitive 40K. <sighs> talking about talking about the game that gets talked about Which the most. Which asshole did you find to come in for that? The mo- <laughs> of absolutely <laughs> lovely human being. Actually, oh, really? All who right. Does, who does a ton of stuff for the community. Good. Um, and I think we're going to have a really interesting conversation about... about how how the miniature wargaming conversation is dominated by one topic, and how I don't know if that's representative of the hobby as a whole. So we'll see. We'll see what his thoughts are. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, we'll see you and um, hear you, and you can listen to us for more of this in the future. And big thanks to Mike again. Till next time, I'm Ash. Have wargaming.